Hey, good morning, Matt. How are you? Paul Hewitt here with Carora, the chairman and CEO. I'm joined here with um, my favorite executive here, uh, executive vice president of corporate development, Oliver Turner. Um, we're happy to be here again. It's been a while since we've seen you. A little bit about Carora. We're um, a gold producer, predominantly based in Western Australia. Uh, we're listed on the TSX, KRR.TO. Um, and we're looking forward to giving you an update here on the second quarter and some of the differentiators we have as a company with our nickel. So how are you, Matt? All good, Paul. It's been far, far too long. You look well. You, you look like you've been working out um, and you got rid of that beard. So it's all good news as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, right. We're going to talk about Q, Q2 numbers, which which obviously you want, to, you want everyone to um, be discussing. I'm kind of more interested in trying to understand what the business has been and what it's become. Because, you know, it, it feels like the operational side of the business has completely revolutionized itself and you're hitting numbers quarter over quarter. I, I want to want to understand how. So let's start with the Q2 numbers. Give us the highlights. What, do you, what are you most pleased with? Yeah, look, I, I just can't ignore the beard thing. So um, at a 50, Neither could I when you had it. years old, um, I don't get the often, hey, you're looking well, so I've, I've got to go there. Um, I took that uh, carbon credit challenge extremely personally. And at 53 years old, I started biking to work. So um, wow. I'm now biking an average of 27 kilometers each way. So about 54 kilometers a day. And the beard had to come off because it was simply too darn hot to be biking. So um, nice to hear at 53, I'm not looking so bad and looking well. So um, let's jump into the quarter because it was truly an amazing quarter. Actually, when I think back uh, several years ago, um, when I first met you, things were quite challenged, even without any milk. But last quarter, we delivered just under 30,700 ounces. That's a record for us since we acquired the Higginsville Mill, Matt. Uh, we acquired the Higginsville Mill in June of uh, 2019. We just closed our second mill here. We're, we're breaking record after record after record. And I know that Oliver's going to get into the share price and doesn't reflect it. But operationally, uh, I can't I can't express my gratitude for the team, for the sacrifices, overcoming the challenges with COVID. Look, Q1, we we were saddled with some tremendous COVID obstacles that that leaked into Q2. In April, we were, were missing half of our Jack Lake miners. For six weeks, we were missing people on Jack Lake. So it, it had an impact, and we're getting through that. Um, we put a lot of things and processes in place to help um, secure our employees first and most foremost, make sure everyone is safe. Um, we're going to have to live with COVID going forward, um, but we're, we're doing a lot of things to make sure that it no longer has tremendous impacts on our costs and our productivity rates. And, and let me talk about a couple more production things that I'm extremely proud of. You know, um, four years ago, Matt, we were talking about when you and I met in Toronto, this, this mine, Beta Hunt, was achieving about 30,000 tons a month from that decline. We have a single decline, remember, one decline. We're putting in the second decline now, and, and I'm happy to report that that is on track, um, probably ahead of schedule. It is ahead of schedule. We're gonna get that done by Q1 of 2023. But my point is we were achieving 30,000 tons out of that single decline, one single ramp. We, were, we pushed that, and, and there were a lot of people that never believed we could actually accomplish 80,000 tons out of that single decline. So more than double. And we did that for nine months in a row, all through 2021 and the start of 2022. What's extremely impressive about the last couple of months in the last quarter are we've accomplished over 100,000 tons. And I'll, I'll, I'll convert this to ounces, but what that means is you think about it. We were 30,000 tons a month here, not that far back, a couple of years ago. We pushed it to 80,000. We're now at a run rate right around very close to that 100,000 tons per month. You annualize that, Matt. That's 1.2 million tons of ore from that decline that was getting 360,000 tons. So I have to repeat it. 1.2 million tons of ore. Our objective is to get beta hunt to 2 million tons. We've been talking about it, Oliver and I, with you, with shareholders. Um, for the last oh, 14 months, it's going to get to 2 million tons. 
but you can already see there's evidence that with one decline, we can get 1.2 million tons uh, per year. And, and at, at a rate of uh, 100,000 tons, we get right around a range of around 80,000 ounces. So it fluctuates depending on grades. But if you use this metric, uh, a, a million tons, which is 80,000 tons a month, 80,000 ounces, you just double it because the average grade is pretty consistent. Um, you're talking about 160,000 tons, 160,000 ounces, my apologies, per year with 2 million tons. That's a huge accomplishment from Beta Hunt considering where we started. Now you bolt on Lakewood. We just, we got the keys, what? Uh, today's August 16th. I think my kids started school yesterday. Um, but We've got the mill here for the last couple of weeks here. We just got the keys. This is really fresh to us. We're going to put out some new numbers on what it means to us. It's accelerating everything. Remember, our objective was to get the, set, the Higginsville mill increased to that throughput by the fourth quarter of 2023. So what we've effectively done here is accelerated that all forward by a full year. And we accomplished that financing. So we hit the market at a good time. We had a lot of good support. Uh, look, it was a bot deal that was oversubscribed. And I got to, I got to again, repeat that because it was oversubscribed because it was a very good use of proceeds. People understood it. It made sense. It mitigated the number one risk we had. When we, when we think about our growth plan, it's an organic growth plan in a, in a great jurisdiction when we look at the two risks we have, it's first the milling. And if you step ahead of that, well, it's the mining. We've already demonstrated, if you just look at the results and you don't listen to me, you just look at the numbers. You say, I don't believe Paul Hewitt. I'll look at the numbers. Forget him. Look at the numbers. The numbers speak for themselves. We went from 30,000 tons to 80. We're at 1.2 million tons per year. We know with a second decline, we're going to get to that 2 million. So you gain confidence into those numbers. You go, okay, look, um, maybe I don't believe the Frenchman, but I believe his numbers. What's the second biggest risk? It was always, always going to be the expansion of that mill. Expanding a mill in the current environment, in the current inflationary environment, with capital costs creeping left and right, with, with labor shortages all over WA, there is no doubt not even one piece of doubt that our original bids that we had, uh, our estimates from 60 to $70 million were creeping up closer to $100 million. And who knows where they would have ended up? One thing is certain, the cost would have been higher because costs are going up exponentially for the expansion. And there certainly would have been delays. We know that there would have been delays. Mitigating that cost inflation and the delays Accelerating it by a full year has really de-risked our company in a way um, that even we hadn't thought and planned exactly. So we, we, we always thought of doing it. We needed to find the right mill. Uh, there were a couple mills that we knew nearby that we were always aggressive on. Um, and we were very fortunate in getting this Lakewood mill. So look, an explosive quarter for us. It wasn't a reasonable quarter. It was explosive for us. We broke a record on ounces. We broke a record on tons. We closed the Lakewood mill. We closed the financing bought deal. So it's it wasn't a regular quarter. We managed to reduce our all-in sustaining costs quarter over quarter by 15%. In, in, look, in dollars, Matt, that's $200 an ounce here. We're going from where we were in Q1 at $1,398 down to uh, that $1,190. And we're setting ourselves up for a great finish of 2022. So operationally, look, these guys are hitting everything, everything out of the park here. We, we couldn't have asked for better results. The team got to remain focused, stay focused and continue to do what we do best. And that's deliver. Well, that, 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 that's my point. Um, the, 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 the difference from when we first started swing to now is, is you know, huge. Um, I don't think anyone doubts your operational abilities and you hit your numbers quarter after quarter, and there seems to be record after record, which, which is great. So, in, in a very meaningful way, and take this take this right way, because I know there's a lot of work involved um, with you, from you and the team. The kind of admin is is 
kind of, I, I don't really care. I, I'm just, I'm now want to look at you really simply and say, can they continue to hit quarter after quarter and, and, and deliver that growth story? Uh, and if so, what are, what are the kind of, the big items in the room. You've obviously described um, Lake Woodmill as being a m massive to you. The the de new decline will be massive um, for you. Is there anything else that I need to be looking at? Or, or, or? Look, look. one thing is certain. We have something that we've been bragging about for some time. And we've recently, just recently, this quarter, put out the tip of the iceberg, first PEA on nickel. And, and with that, why don't I let... Um, Young Oliver here talk about the nickel PEA here. Okay. Uh, um, Oliver, why don't you talk about the nickel PEA? Because it is, in my opinion, one of the largest differentiators we have from so many of our peers and competitors, and it's going to help us a lot in the future. Go ahead, Oliver. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you, you know, it help, helps on a number of levels. So obviously, you know, a few weeks back, we put out the, the results of the, the initial nickel uh, PEA, which is based on the first resource that Corus put out in January of this year. We put out a nickel resource, about 20,000 nickel tons that we have, uh, just under 3% nickel, which is not bad at all in the M&I category. Uh, you know, doing the work on that and translating that into initial PEA gave us an eight-year mine life. But, you know, what your investors need to be focused on are the sort of, sort of first three or four years. And I'll tell you why, because that mine life will be extended. That mine will be back, that mine life will be backfilled as will the production profile in the later years. So the nickel PA does a, a couple things for us, or the nickel uh, operation does. Obviously downside protection. If, uh, you know, if gold retraces here, none of us, none of us uh, think that's the case. We're all bullish gold, but of course, if it does, we have that uh, sort of backup plan there. And I'll grab some numbers around that in a second. And then secondly, of course, you know, taking a look at the macro environment, I don't think there's any investor in the world right now uh, that is uh, bearish on uh, EV demand over the next several years. So with respect to, you know, support of nickel pricing and, and where new nickel has to come from, uh, we are right next door to one of the largest miners in the world, newly restarted nickel facility, BHP have restarted their Convalda facility. Remember, BHP has signed that offtake agreement with uh, Tesla uh, and is in search of high grade uh, green nickel. So we have talked about that over the course of the, the last year or so, and we're finally able to wrap some real numbers around it. So when you look at the production profile going forward there on the nickel side of things, we're going to be touching close to 4,000 nickel tons a year. Just for context, this year we're doing about 450 to 550 nickel tons per year from remnant mining areas. Now, this new uh, nickel mine plan that we have here in the first few years, where we're touching that 4,000 nickel tons per year, is mining uh, brand new virgin areas. And I'm sure you're going to want to understand a little bit more about those areas. We can talk about them a little bit later on. But uh, you know, understanding uh, that we're going to be mining new primary areas no longer higher cost remnant nickel mining. It's going to be from infrastructure that we have in place that you can mine both nickel and gold from. That's why the capital costs associated with it are so low. And I'm sure some of your investors noticed that as well. So a very high return nickel project that adds a whole nother facet to the beta hunt operation increases margin, brings down costs on a, you know, on a per ounce basis. Uh, if you use the base case scenario that we've used, and obviously we recommend your investors turn to the press release uh, to get some of these numbers firsthand, but $19,500 US per ton nickels are base case well below spot of 23,000 today, well below con consensus, which is about 25,000. You get about 80 to hundred bucks an ounce in byproduct credits. And as Paul said at the beginning, that is the tip of the iceberg. Right? We're just getting started here. Uh, those initial few years of mine life are very accurate. Towards the end, we're going to be backfilling as we extend that zone. So very happy to get that out. Uh, you know, we've turned a lot of heads our, our way, had a lot of inbounds when we put that release out, both from institutions and from other companies. So really excited to get that uh, you know out of the way and move on to the next level of study and advance that project. Okay, so nickel's going to be important. Um, and nickel has been on a, on a tear for the last year, and so, but like most base metals have come, on, come off a bit um, at the moment. But I, I appreciate the, the, the PA should be adding value to the company and to the story. I'm looking, and I pause, referenced it already, so I'm, like, I'm going to come straight back to you on this one, um, Oliver, which is the share price is not performing. You're not getting valued the way that you think you should be valued. Um, you know, gold is has a little bit of downward pressure on it at the, at the moment. How, how do you adjust your plans in, in that environment? We've seen some, you know, sh you know shocking headlines out, out of you know 
uh, China recently as well, with regards to their zero, zero COVID policies, you know, effect, affecting uh, people's plans and uh, ruining people's days. So how, how are you interpreting that? Um, do you adjust your behavior, your planning? Yeah, I think I mean, you know, for, for mining companies and, and mining equities, uh, unfortunately, those two stories sometimes don't don't line up, right? So you can be delivering operationally as we have, and I don't think there's uh, yes, gold's come off a little bit, but uh, you know, Paul will tell us uh, you know many times over. I don't think there are many gold companies that are complaining about the gold price right now from a revenue basis. We are very happy. Obviously, the the cost side of the equation has been squeezed for the entire sector. In fact, for every sector on earth, uh, the cost uh, side of the equation has been squeezed with respect to you know global inflationary pressures, as we can talk about. But our focus is first and foremost to deliver a sustainable profit generating business uh, at the operational level. And when that translates into share price, you know you have to put everything, of course, into context. Um, we had an incredible run. So it's about a year ago today we ran about the share price, same share price, uh, but this time in in uh, 2021, uh, maybe a little bit later, we went from this price up to north of seven dollars and fifty cents. Um, you know, nobody enjoyed that more than us. Uh, you know, our number one job as a, as a management team on the investor side is to make shareholders money. We made people a lot of money uh, with that run, right? When the situation globally changed, uh, you know, earlier this year, uh, we were one of the few gold stocks. In fact, we were the best performing gold stock in the world over, over the trailing 12 months. You can look that up quite easily. Um, you know, shareholders and, and, and senior fund managers, we were the first one to be liquidated. Uh, simply put, we were trading at a premium. We are extremely well valued. We're getting valued for a, a huge amount of our growth profile going forward. Um, they saw the macro situation trading, uh, changing rather, and, and they traded the stock. And obviously, it's been a pretty strong retrace. Where we are today on a relative valuation basis, when you when you look at what fundamental analysts, which is, of course, you know, I said on your show before, is what I, used to, I did for seven years prior to this. When you look at where we are on a relative valuation basis compared to the group, we're bang back around that 0.4 times now. So we're right in line with the group. We traded well ahead of the group, and now we've come back and retraced to be in line with the average group. Now, how do we drive this uh, forward from here? Number one, deliver operationally. Number two, make sure that you're getting your message out there because when things change in, the, in these markets, they change very, very quickly. I've talked about quant funds on your show on your show before. Uh, you know, when things shift, shift from a quantitative perspective, capital flows move very, very quickly. So we want to make sure we have that news that we have all the fund managers and retail shareholders up to speed on the opportunity that's available here. So that when those funds do come back into the into the sector, we're the first port of call for that capital. So we have, you know, we are an order of magnitude stronger than we were a year ago. The share price and valuation is, well, valuation basis is actually lower, but share price is back, is right back where it is. So if you want gold exposure as an investor, and obviously we're in the gold business because we think gold exposure is where you should be, this is a fantastic time to be looking at these stories and a fantastic time to be paying attention to the fundamental news. Right. But you're not in the business of producing gold. You're in the business of making money. Right. So right. that's the, what's the first thing, you know, any business should be about, whatever sector they're in. So, um, what big mining companies tend to do is produce cash to plant straight back in the ground. Right. And you, you know, you're, you know, with the mill acquisition recently, um, with the, you know, I know you're driving costs down and, 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 and look, you know, trying to stay in control of everything that you can stay in, in control of. Um, but you're, you're spending money to find more gold. How, how do you get that balance right between making money and, you know, maybe giving it back to the shareholders and just you know, spending it on finding more ounces? Because it's, it's not a science project here, um, guys. It's, it's, it's a situation where you're, you're here to make money for shareholders. So I'm, I'm intrigued by the, how do you either give shareholders money back or how do you drive the share price up? And, and in which case, what do you need to be rewarded for to do that? Yeah, no, it's a good, a good, good, uh, good question and a good statement. But you know, number one, you got to make sure that you find more gold because you got to be able to mine gold and out yours as well. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is a depleting reserve business. Everybody knows that these are finite resources until you add more resources. So, in order for there to be a business in, a, in, a, in several years down the road, you continuously need to be investing in finding more gold, in prioritizing projects. Uh, you know, mines are not easy to find. Uh, mines are not easy to expand. And finding new gold ounces is hard and finding new economic gold ounces is hard. So you continuously need to reinvest in that business. And I'll tell you why you need to do that, even from a share, a share price perspective. You are valued based on your future production profile discounted back to today. 
You're not valued based on only what you're operating and what you're executing on today. You're valued based on what the future profile looks like. As you add more ounces, as you build out mine life, as you add future margin, that increases the net asset value of your company upon which investors buy a multiple. So you need to have that balance. And you said it right there before. How do you decide between the two of them? So we have areas in which we do return uh, cash to shareholders. We have an active NCIB, which we can execute when we're not in blackout periods. And when we think the stock is at a valuation level where a dollar spent there has a higher return than a dollar spent on fundamental projects, um, then we will execute on that NCIB. A fantastic use of proceeds that we just talked about was the acquisition of the Lakewood Mill. Um, right now, we're down the, down the barrel of a $7 million first year investment into that nickel PEA. There is not a nickel project on this planet, even if we take the entire capital cost over the eight years, $18.7 million Australian. What's that US? About $15 million. Name a nickel project in the world with a $15 million capital outlay in order to, uh, to mine close to 10,000 nickel tons. I'll do the work for you. There isn't one, right? So that is a fantastic use of proceeds is to put our money that's generated from our operations into that to enhance our margins, to generate more uh, cash flow, to put cash on the balance sheet, to enhance our future options. There's other things we can look at down the road, of course, as well. There's potential dividends, there's stronger buybacks. Um, so there's multiple ways to ensure that shareholders do well, but we've got to build out that business. That is the nature of mining and you have to build out that business. I, I, I get that. Well, listen, wait, yeah, wait, Matt, that, that was... Even for me, it, it, it reminded me as Oliver, as an analyst there, um, it was actually quite good, actually very good. Um, but l- let me ask you a question, Matt. Let, let's let's be honest and frank here, the three of us on this call. What do you believe um, nickel is going to do here in the future? Where do you think nickel is going? Just just answer that first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll follow up. Well, there, there's Did good there's Oliver, good news. I do I do a weekly nickel show, so I, I feel equipped. <laughs> for this one, obviously, right. the, 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 there's been a retrenchment in, in the price, uh, you know, in, in, in the past, I'd, you know, since February, right? And we've called the nickel price um, right for the last two two years. So I think that we are going to, it will continue to grow because there's just not enough nickel for the demand. Supply demand fundamentals tell you that. Um, obviously, whatever's going on in China at the moment will hopefully go away with the zero COVID tolerance thing. And we think that the new year, we, we should see some, you know, some meaningful um, growth in the price. So it's only going north. I think that's the answer you wanted, but it, it's also what, what I happen to believe. So so look, I, I don't think there's anybody who will listen to this call that would disagree that e- electric vehicles are going away. They're going to expand. It doesn't matter which company you're with. Electric vehicles are coming. You're going to need lithium. You're going to need nickel. We're like you. We believe nickel is a huge differentiator. And, and as a gold company, I don't know of too many gold companies that have nickel like a byproduct credit as good as we do. Remember, Beta Hunt was a nickel mine for 40 years. All the costs, everything, the lights, everything, all the GNA was paid by nickel. Um, we start ramping up this nickel. And again, Oliver touched on it. It's the tip of the iceberg here. It's really the tip of the iceberg. We've got a tiger by the tail here. We start expanding this nickel and out of those remnant errors, as he was pointing out. Look, when you're mining remnant errors, I, I was a Jack Lake miner for 10 years of my career. You're mining about three to five tons of mansion. You go into new areas, your productivity rates can expand all the way from 15 to 35 tons of mansion. It's more than three to five times and in better grades. So, but the inflation on some of the commodities, we, we don't have much to say. The only way we get an advantage is by buying in bulk with two mills, buying commodities in bulk with two mills, buying bolting supplies uh, with two mills. So that, that helps us and differentiates us in so many ways at reducing and managing those costs while, while metal prices are pretty good. So um, when I think of where we're going, and as Oliver said about reinvesting, we'd always forecast and, and told the whole world that 2022, we were going to be investing in this company. And it's more than just replenishing resource and reserves in 2022. Originally, it was about the mill expansion. We mitigated it by buying liquid, but we need the second decline. That's 50 to $60 million as well. We have to reinvest it. That's infrastructure though, that'll be depreciated over the next 20 years. 
We're talking about putting in a whole new ramp, a whole new ventilation system. This is going to last 20 plus years here. We're investing into our future. 2022 was always about putting that money into the ramp, putting in the money into the decline. Uh, again, I'm repeating myself on, on, on the mill expansion because the acceleration of the $80 million Lakewood acquisition, uh, that was that was a home run for us. So that I, just adds a bit of color on everything we've been discussing here. It, it, it does. But look, where, where I'm trying to get to, um, Paul, with this is, um, is trying to understand how you view return on a capital invested, right? So I think Oliver's given us some clues there in terms of, you know, sh- you know, if share buybacks are, are the right way to go, you'll do that. Or should it be, you know, holes holes in the ground? And I don't necessarily, in, in a, like I say, in a meaningful way, I don't I don't want the, to get into the admin of where you're drilling because I know you're good at finding gold and you're, you know, the, the grades are increasing and you've got decent budgets allocated to that. But it comes back to the, what are the big ticket items? Obviously, yes, uh, uh, the decline, the um, lake, liquid mill stuff, um, the, the nickel PEA, for, for sure. I'm an uh, absolute buyer. But what about things like the, you know, the, the debt refinancing? Why was that a good idea? idea um you know what does your balance sheet look look like when will there be will there be um you know distribution of cash to shareholders i mean what 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 are the kind of headlines that you look at to go do you know what this the balance of the way we're addressing i'm hearing you Matt. yeah i'm going to repeat a couple things there's some tremendous synergies here between the gold and, and and nickel whenever we put in some infrastructure we get access to both The debt restructure, look, our interest rate was at 10% with that original debt. We cut that down to 4.5%. That's cut by better than half. And it set ourselves up with a line of credit behind ourselves. Why did we do it? One thing I've learned in my career, and, and I'm sure I think you and I have even talked about this, the best time to get money is when you don't need it. Corora was not in a position where we needed extra cash. We did not need to do this. Why we wanted to do it was we wanted to cut the debt in half and we wanted to put that credit facility in place in case there's an opportunity. Not necessarily a catastrophe. Everyone thinks, oh my God, they put that in because in case, um, look, sorry for the words, the shit hits a fan. That's not true. What about an opportunity that exists where um, a $30 million investment could get an, a return of 250%. In, in my eyes, we always put this in place to be ready, have cash in hand to explore opportunities. And our cash position is quite strong. And, and more importantly, we're going to continue to build cash the rest of the year. With, with Lakewood being bought and us raising the money, we're now in a position where we're going to spend the money on the ramp, but the additional cash and capital we were going to spend on on Lakewood is much less. We were talking in the neighborhood of sixty million. We're going to have to spend some money. It might be this year three to five million, and some tails work next year. But it's nowhere near the amount we had to. So we're all of our touch on the NCIB. We just got it refreshed. Um, we will always evaluate. Does it make more sense spending it here or on the NCIB? And, and look, I, I for one have never once said, "Let us get to the organic growth. Let us get delivered. Let us get to that sustainable rate, and let us evaluate dividends." I believe that we need an opportunity in this current market environment to just finish what we started. What we started was aggressive. What we're doing is aggressive. Uh, the team is delivering something that's magnificent that a lot of people said couldn't be done. Let us finish this and then let's explore the opportunities of how you give out some extra cash when you have it on the ballot sheet. Corora's, like any other company, will do things that are accretive for our shareholders. At this moment, Corora is very focused on our organic growth plan. We've put out a plan um, it was in June, I believe, of 2021, uh, more than a year ago. We're, we're following through with that plan. We're delivering on that plan. Let us get it done and, and let us explore those other opportunities. Uh, and I, I believe the share price will correct itself. Uh, you know, the markets, it is where it is now. We've got to remain focused. Don't get people hurt. Continue to deliver um, at the right cost. We'll be rewarded like we have been in the past. 
Do you think that the institutional guys will come back into because they, 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 what surprised me is that the institutions have been as nervous as retail in the current you know risk off well I, I I would challenge that I don't I don't I don't agree with that statement completely in fact uh, I think that's one where I would probably drug test you again but uh, I think you passed the we, last one I gave you so we, I think you're all right <laughs> um, no I'm kidding. Sorry for those listeners. That it's an old joke. It, is. it just runs and runs and runs. It's a long running joke if it's your first one. Uh, no, look, um, I think we've seen some support from some institutions. In fact, I've been on the phone with some. I think where where it's been more challenging for us is those quants, I think. Um, and Oliver's more of an expert than I am. Now, those algorithms and the quants, uh, I think there you're seeing more of a sell-off. But who do you pick up the phone and call? You know, the, you got a robot listening in on my quarterly call, looking and, and scanning stuff in press releases, um, earnings per share, all in sustaining costs, uh, things like that all matter. Um, but you can't have a dialogue with anybody. You can't say, well, let me explain what occurred and how this is going to improve. Now, with an institution, Oliver and I are on the phone and we're talking to them. In fact, I, I know of I know of four that are not only taking this opportunity to buy. I know some that made some money, as Oliver pointed out, that are buying back, that are coming back into the story. So I'm very aware of institutions saying, "Hey, look, Paul, um, I made some good money from you guys. You know, you guys did what you said. Um, I'm coming back in the story. I, I we just had two meetings that people are coming back into the story. Some of the look." We had some big investors come in on the on the on the financing. They're they're not. Look, we're we're speaking to them on a daily basis. They're still supporting our stock. So I, I would challenge that comment, and wouldn't mind hearing what Oliver has to say. He's he's better at the quants than I am. Um, Oliver, any comment on on that? Yeah, for sure. So when when it comes to sort of momentum and in index trading, right? Those those are what what Paul's talking about there. So those those that's capital that flows in flows out. Uh, you know, based on quantitative in indicators. When it comes to the you know the, the shareholder base that we've taken uh, you know two to three years to build here in terms of top tier institutions, so I'll give you one example. Uh, I can't say who it is. It's top five uh, top five of our shareholders, a large participant in that financing just uh, just a short while ago. One and a half billion dollar mining fund. It feels good to say that uh, there aren't too many of those left these days. Uh, is been active, very very active. Yeah. In fact, we've got a call with them uh, later on uh, this week uh, to discuss more. So they're thrilled about the nickel PEA and actually you know linking that to your your comments on on ROIC right. There's, there's two ways to increase ROIC. You can increase your, your operating profit or you can basically uh, reduce your, your equity investment on, on the lower half. Now, if you're thinking about a high ROIC project, uh, you're thinking about something, again, think about the nickel, right? If you're investing $18.7 million over the life of the asset uh, for the cash flow, that's going to be the free cash flow that's going to be generated. It's going to be generating north of $20 million a year at those base case assumptions, right? This is another you know fantastic uh, yeah, number for your investors here. If you increase the price of nickel by 20%, right? So from call it 2300 where we are today, that's got to be 265, 27,000, something like that. We we're, were last there in May, okay? $27,000 US per ton nickel. The value of the project increases by over 60%. On an ROIC basis, it's unbelievable. That's over 230% IRR. So it is, it is something that is a huge lever. Uh, very large, uh, you know, fundamentally sound mining investors, such as these institutions, are looking at things like that and saying, this is a very high return project. We want to be buying the stock at these levels. Uh, they are buying the stock at these levels. Um, the last thing I'll say on institutional fund managers is about a month ago, we had a uh, cash balance of, amongst active uh, money managers at the highest levels worldwide since 2001. So there's a lot of cash that's sitting there waiting to be deployed. And in the mining sector, we actually started to see some of that come back in. Comex, Longs and Gold are, are now uh, you know positive again after being negatively trending since the beginning of this year. So that capital is starting to flow back in. And to bring it back to what we said at the beginning, you deliver, you update, and you make sure that you're the first port of call when they want to reallocate that capital. And that's what's happening today. So uh, you know, definitely all that has to come together and remember how quickly we went from $3.20 to $7.50. Uh, you know, your, your shareholders might roll their eyes at this, but you actually don't want to see your share price rise that, that quickly. Uh, you want to build stable bases. You want to maintain levels, right? Uh, the entire sector and the entire mar market's gone up and gone down. So building a good base here uh, and let's take the next leg up. Let's build another base and let's get right back there. 
I don't think there's any doubt in our mind that, uh, you know, with what we're building here today, the value of this business is well north of where we were at $7.50. And our job is to continue to build that business uh, so that the market can value it appropriately. Look, uh, look I, I want to share one line with you, Matt, that um, we, we have heard, Oliver and I, on about the last four calls. Oliver and I have been doing a lot of marketing to some of those funds, uh, the institutions you were talking about. And this is a consistent message that we have both heard, the two of us, um, on separate calls and on the same calls. You're not the company we worry about. This is fund manager speaking to us. You're not the guys we worry about. You guys are delivering. I have a, a bag full of other groups um, that I have to worry about. You're not on the worry list, Corora. Um, it's good that we catch up. Thanks for the update. Keep doing what you're doing. We're supportive. And, and that's been a message very consistent that we've heard from those institutions we've added. So, um, look, I think that that that's, that probably sends us where uh, in a good position where we're, we're in a very strong position to end the year 2022. We, we tightened up our guidance, Matt. You know, we, 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 our guidance was 110 to 135. We tightened that up from to 120 to 135 because of our confidence in, in what we're going to do in the second half. The worst is behind us. It's looking in our rear view mirror. The first half of the year, our costs were around $1,200 an ounce. We're talking between 11, 1200 for the, for the whole year. That means we've got to be well south of that in the second half of the year. We've got to perform much better in the second half of the year in order to deliver that guidance we just put out two days ago. So we're off to an amazing finish of the year with the Lakewood acquisition in hand. We're getting used to that mill with the PEA that we've got with the advancement of the ramp. I, I think you, your, our shareholders, your viewers, um, have got a lot to look forward and there's no better time. If you're looking for a time to come in, um, you're not going to find a better time than now. So that's, that's about all I got to say, young man. <laughs>